Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Patrick Dean, author of the new nonfiction book, A Window to Heaven, The Daring First Ascent of Denali, America's Wildest Peak. Patrick, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Jeff. Good to be here. Looking forward to talking to you. Sure, absolutely. Well, to begin with, for those who may not be familiar with Denali, can you tell us about the mountain and where it's located and a little bit about its history? Sure. Denali is uh, the mountain formerly known as Mount McKinley. Uh, it's in the Alaska Range. Uh, it's the highest mountain in the Northern Hemisphere at over 20,000 feet. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it creates its own weather systems like peaks of that size do. It's known for the, the brutal weather uh, near its summit. And uh, not long after the gold rush at the end of the 19th century, people started uh, thinking about how they might climb it. Well, you've obviously written an entire book about the first ascent of Denali, but can you tell us a little bit about, about the ascent? When was it and who made it? Well, the very first successful ascent was in 1913. Uh, there was a group of four men uh, co-led by the subject of this biography, uh, Archdeacon Hudson Stuck, an Episcopal priest and missionary, uh, and three other men, men. And uh, it was quite an achievement in 1913 to be, to be able to be up there, to get up on the top. And I'm curious, what got you interested in this expedition and what led you to writing a book about it? <laughs> I've told the story a few times. Uh, in my 20s, I worked in a really great bookstore in Mississippi. Uh, it's called Lemuria Books. I recommend it to anyone. And uh, I was obsessed with two spots on the globe for some reason, Africa and Alaska. And I was reading everything I could find on both. And at some point, I came across this book called 10,000 Miles with a Dog Sled by some guy named Hudson Stuck. Um, and I, I picked it up. I still have that copy. I actually used it to write this book. Um, but I read it and a bunch of other stuff about Alaska. And then uh, fast forward a few decades, and I, I've moved to Suwannee, Tennessee, where the University of the South is, which happens to be where Hudson Stuck got his seminary training. Uh, he left in 1892 with a, with a Doctor of Divinity degree from here before he went off to uh, Texas and then Alaska. And... Uh, at some point, I, I realized that the guy who was memorialized in All Saints Chapel in Swanee at the university was the same guy who'd written this 10,000 Miles for the Dog Sled book. I was getting my master's in theology at the University of the South at the time and uh, decided to write my thesis on him. And from there, it just sort of you know blossomed into a book idea. That's great. Well, in your research for this book and about the expedition, were there things that you learned that surprised you that you didn't know about before you dug into the research? Quite a lot of things, actually. Um, you know, I, I, it, it was interesting. It was fascinating to find just the character of Stuck because he was such a, a fierce advocate for the rights of Alaska natives. Um, as I mentioned, we were, were just at the point of the of the gold rush, which really started in 1897, and Stuck arrived in 1904, and uh, immediately his sympathies and his efforts and energies were largely on behalf of the Alaska natives. Um, he felt that their customs and traditions and ways of life um, were being overwhelmed by this wave of prospectors and miners and settlers from from the lower 48, and he he thought that they deserved to be preserved and that they deserved to be treated well, and that was basically his his work, his life's work in Alaska. Well, I'm curious, did you climb part of Denali as part of your research? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so, and I've often said this too, if you want to really have imposter syndrome, try writing a book about a place you've never been. Um, I was due to go to Alaska in May of 2020, <laughs> um, as well as to Austin, Texas, where the Episcopal Archives are located. And uh, the COVID epidemic shut that down. So I had to rely on remote sources and digital sources um, and very good friends and connections I'd made um, virtually in Alaska. And so I had to do the best I could with a lot of help from a lot of people. Um, I was able to <laughs> pull it together. So, no, I've only been about halfway up um, anything as tall as Denali. I've been about 11,000 feet up in the, in the Rockies. So I'm I've been halfway there. Got it. Well, 
on that note, I mean, I'm not a mountain climber, but it's my understanding that currently the vast majority of people who climb Mount Everest uh, use oxygen near the summit. Is that the case with Denali at this point? No, it's not typical to use oxygen. Um, the main problem with Denali, as I mentioned earlier, is the weather. Mm -hmm. um, it can be it can be 100 degrees below zero on the peak of, of Denali. And uh, it's the weather that forces people off more, much more than the altitude. So no, it's not necessary, but there are plenty of other, <laughs> there are plenty of other uh, hazards when you try to, uh, when you try to get to the top of Denali. Sure. And, and I'm curious, I mean, this was, did you say it was in 1913? Was that yes. the first? Yep. So, so I'm curious, how did these climbers train or was that even something that people did or was it just sheer will that got them up the mountain? What, what was <laughs> What did that process look, the preparation for this first successful ascent? You know, I don't think, I don't think a thought was made. The closest that uh, anybody came to thinking about training for the mountain was when Hudson stuck, said he was going to stop smoking his pipe <laughs> <laughs> because he was a lifelong pipe smoker and, and that he felt it. Uh, you could see the result of that when they were almost at the top and he could barely breathe. But, uh, you know, I think the main training they had was their experience in Alaska. All four of them had spent a good deal of time in the backcountry in Alaska, dog sledding around from place to place and just, and just surviving and living in that, in that environment. And I think that was, that was what they, you know, thought would be enough to get them, get them up there. And I'm curious how, how long of a, of a journey was it for them? Oh, well, they left, um, they left the town of, uh, uh Tanana and on March 17th, it took them about three weeks just to get to the base of the mountain by dog sled. Um, and then, you know, took them almost two months, well, more than two months to actually get to the top. So, you know, today you can take a helicopter to the base of the glacier and, and, and Denali. So they didn't have that luxury. Mm -hmm. So it was quite an extended trip for them. Wow. And how long were they at the um, summit? A day, <laughs> a part mm -hmm. of one day. It was one of those things where they, uh, it was seven degrees below zero, even though it was sunny. So they, uh, they zipped up there and did some things and planted a flag and said a prayer, um, Huck Chuck being the Episcopal priest. Sure. And then they, and then they went, came back down. Gotcha. It took well, them three days to get back down <laughs> after all those, after all those weeks to get up, it took them three days to get back down to the, to the ground, to ground well, level. Well, are you working on another book now? I am actually. I'm in the thick of a, a second biography. It's uh, a man named Mark Catesby. He was an 18th century English naturalist who came over here in the 1720s and uh, spent some time exploring in the backcountry of South Carolina, Florida, and the Bahamas, and went back to London and produced the very first illustrated book about the plants and animals of North America. Um, it was quite a sensation in the 1730s, um, sort of an, uh, did Audubon a century before Audubon did, except in, it wasn't just birds with him. It was plants and lizards and, you know, fish and everything. So, um, he's kind of a really neat figure in history and he's sort of been overshadowed by Audubon and others. So I'm enjoying sort of trying to bring his story back to light. And how did you first hear of him? Gosh, you know, that's sort of lost in the mist of time. <laughs> I had, uh, uh, I was reading about the early naturalists in the South, being from, you know, growing up in Mississippi, I, I read a bit about the, you know, the pioneering naturalists down here, like William and Bartram, William Bartram and people like that. And I remember hearing about this Catesby guy and, and trying to find something on him years and years ago, and there was nothing there. And I went, oh, hmm, oh, well. And uh, he just sort of popped back up into my mind after I finished the stuck book. So here we are. Hi, it's Jeff, host of the podcast. Are you looking for a new podcast to listen to? Are you interested in Australian fiction? Or perhaps you're a writer looking for some inspiration or writing tips. Then Talking Aussie Books is a podcast for you. Host Claudine Tanellis is an avid reader and writer who loves nothing more than chatting about books. In weekly episodes, Claudine chats to emerging and established Australian authors about their work, making it her mission to spotlight homegrown talent. With more than 170 episodes available and interviews with globally published authors that include Jane Harper, Sally Hepworth, Dervla McTiernan, and Anna Downs, 
there's something to suit all taste. Check out Talking Aussie Books, available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. Again, that's Talking Aussie Books. Check it out today. That's great. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are thinking about or working on their own nonfiction books? Wow, that's a question I don't think I've ever been asked before, Jeff. <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> uh, pick a subject that you're going to love spending a lot of time with, basically, I think is the one thing. Um, you've got to do it for um, just the sheer joy of, of you know, compiling the material and doing the research and writing the story. Um, otherwise it'll, it'll start to feel like, you know, drudgery and you know, that's not what's writing supposed to be. I mean, there's going to be drudgery in it. There's going to be hardship and there's going to be times when you're sweating through chapters like I am right now on Kate's <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, overall it's gotta be fun. It's gotta be a labor of love for you. So pick a topic that you'll, you'll enjoy spending a lot of time with like that. That's great. Well, what books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh gosh, so many. I just finished Candace Millard's new one, um, River of the Gods, about the the search for the source of the Nile. Um, you really can't go wrong with Candace Millard. She's written, you know, now a handful of really, really great nonfiction books about famous people from Teddy Roosevelt to Winston Churchill and now uh Richard Burton and um uh, and John Speak. So that's a great place to, that's a great place to start. I think if you want a really good nonfiction book. That's great. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your book, A Window to Heaven? So my website is patrickdean.co, C-O. Uh, and I'm on all the social media, uh, usually at Patrick Dean or at Patrick L. Dean on Twitter. And uh, yeah, those would be great places to find me. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Patrick Dean, author of the new nonfiction book, A Window to Heaven, The Daring First Ascent of Denali, America's Wildest Peak. The book is available now, so go buy a copy. And Patrick, thanks for doing this interview. Thanks so much, Jeff. Really enjoyed yeah. it. Thank you. Hudson Stuck could barely breathe. A tough and experienced outdoorsman who had spent the last decade dog sledding and tramping across Alaska and the Yukon Stuck nevertheless gasped in the high, thin air, 20,000 feet above sea level. He and his three companions stood just below the summit ridge of Denali, the highest peak in North America, on a clear, windy, four-degree below day. Stuck wore six pairs of socks inside his leather moccasins, with iron ice creepers or crampons attached to the bottom. Immense lynx fur-lined mitts covered inner scotch wool gloves, and his torso was layered beneath a fur-hooded Alaskan parka. Yet, Stuck wrote, until high noon, feet were like lumps of iron. Behind them stretched what Stuck called the dim blue lowlands of the future Denali National Park, with threads of stream and patches of lake that still carry ice along their banks. A few smaller peaks squatted off to the northeast, and every other direction, the immensity of the mountain they perched on blocked their views of Mount Foraker and the other peaks in the Alaska Range. Above them, just a few hundred more yards of climbing and the prize, to be the first humans to set foot atop Denali, would be theirs. It was June 7th, 1913. They were Stuck, Episcopal Archdeacon of Alaska and the Yukon, the oldest of the group at nearly 50 years old, short and wiry, his neatly trimmed beard the only one among the four, Walter Harper, the youngest at age 20, half Alaskan native, fit and confident. Harry Karstens, 34, calmly competent from his years in the Alaskan backcountry. And Robert Tatum, 21, the greenest member of the team. They had launched this expedition eight weeks earlier, enduring bitter cold, severe altitude, and the loss of key supplies to a campfire. The team had arrived at their last camp just below 18,000 feet the night before. Awakening to a brilliant, bitterly cold morning, the party had reached the summit slope after eight grueling hours with Harper in the lead. Surrounded by nothing but snow and ice, their toes and fingers numb, they approached the final ridge to the summit. Though all the men were unable to fully take in air, 
It was curious to see every man's mouth open for breathing, Stuck would later write. It was hardest for him. Everything kept turning black for Stuck as he choked and gasped, almost unable to get any breath at all. The missionary's load had already been reduced. The other members had divided up the contents of his pack, leaving him only the bulky mercurial barometer he had stubbornly carried up the mountain to make scientific observations on the summit. Now he struggled even under the barometer's weight. Finally, Harper, the youngest and strongest member of the expedition on this day, doubled back to where Stuck knelt in the snow, took the barometer, and hoisted it onto his back. Harper's presence on the mountain was important to Stuck for more than just his youthful vigor and physical strength. Since coming to Alaska in 1904 to become Archdeacon of Alaska and the Yukon, Stuck had become a fervent champion of the rights of the native people. In the Alaska of this era, a raucous and deeply unsettled meeting point between traditional native ways and the modern white culture, a center of feverish trade and feverish vice, in Stuck's words, Stuck spent most of his time ministering to the Athabascan peoples in his region. He bore no illusions that their lives would be improved by the onslaught of Western ways. Harper, who was half Athabascan and half Irish, represented Stuck's aspirations for the natives of the far north. Walter's father, Arthur Harper, a distant figure in his life, was a pioneer in the history of white Alaska, the first to imagine gold in the Yukon, where he met Walter's mother. Walter was raised by his mother in an Athabascan village and at 16 met Stuck at the mission school in Tanana. They forged a lifelong connection. On Denali and Stuck's words, Harper ran Karstens close in strength, pluck, and endurance. Robert Tatum was a Tennessean who had come to Alaska to study for holy orders in the Episcopal Church. He had proved himself the previous winter by joining a heroic relief effort, helping deliver by dog sled desperately needed supplies to two women missionaries down the dangerous ice of the frozen Tanana River. His experience with surveying tools and other scientific instruments, and his willingness to serve as the cook for the expedition, along with what Stuck termed his consistent courtesy and considerateness, made Tatum a very pleasant comrade. Harry Karstens had been in Alaska for almost two decades and learned its often harsh lessons firsthand. He had earned the right to be considered a sourdough, a term derived from prospectors' habit of carrying a starter of sourdough bread in a pouch around their neck, later expanded to describe those who'd been in the far north long enough to prove themselves. He had made his reputation in the backcountry since the Klondike Gold Rush of 1897, making his reputation on the mail routes, prospector streams, and hunting expeditions of early 1900s Alaska. Stuck explicitly relied on Karstens for his outdoor skills and experience, as well as his toughness. Karstens, on the other hand, had less sympathy than Harper for Stuck's difficulties. To Karstens, a hardened miner and backwoodsman, Stuck's insistence on spending time with the books and writing materials he brought to Denali, not to mention the burden that carrying such extra weight imposed on everyone, amounted to little more than lying in the tent. Karstens' antagonism toward Stuck, which increased with each step up the mountain, was fated to flare into far worse. For his Stuck, for his part, Stuck had always admired Karstens, describing him as strong, confident, and resourceful, the true leader of the expedition in the face of difficulty and danger. He would never understand his former partner's antagonism in the wake of the expedition's success and fame. But for now, Stuck and the others had to put all animosities aside and focus on putting one foot in front of the other, slowly and deliberately gasping and grasping for the summit. <laughs> 